so that is a whole nother story, but in, uh, in June of 2011, I was confirmed by the United States Senate and sworn in as director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service by then Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar. Little backstory, that's my son whose birthday is today. Um, <clears throat> Michael is 28 years old and that's my daughter um, on the right. My wife was in Reno, Nevada at a business meeting. She couldn't get back. And I, I told Ken, can we wait a day? And he said, no, you need to be sworn in right now. As if he were afraid the United States Senate would realize they made a grave mistake. <laughs> um, so uh, I had the good fortune of working with an incredible team at the Department of the Interior and the, and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And we accomplished much in the six years that I was director of the United States of the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. A few highlights. Um, we created the world's largest permanently protected area, the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. Um, I have to give credit where credit's due. We actually didn't create it. It was President George uh, W. Bush who created the monument. But what we did was we pushed that monument out to the full extent of the United States jurisdiction. So on either side of the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, 200 miles out um, into the ocean. Um, the world's largest permanently protected area anywhere. It's bigger than the state of Alaska. We um, recovered and removed from the Endangered Species Act more species than had been delisted, uh, recovered and delisted by all previous administrations combined, from Richard Nixon uh, to George W. Bush. Um, and that uh, it proves that the Endangered Species Act can work. We can bring species back. Um, and you'll see many species that you would recognize there, um, the, the brown pelican, um, the, uh, the Louisiana black bear, the humpback whale. Um, and w over there on the right, um, the first fish ever to be delisted due to recovery, the iconic Oregon chub. We grabbed the attention of the world to the crisis of elephant uh, poaching and trafficking um, by taking the entire stockpile of, the United, of confiscated ivory in the United States and, and crushing it. Here in Denver, where we crushed six tons of ivory, and then again in uh, Times Square in New York City, where we crushed an additional two tons of, of ivory in uh, 2015. And we grabbed uh, the attention of the world to this crisis, working with the Wildlife Conservation Society and 127 other uh, AZA accredited zoos, mounting a campaign called 96 Elephants, representing the fact that every day 96 elephants are, are poached um, for one purpose, for their ivory. So we called attention to this crisis, um, and we, which uh, enabled us to then ban the domestic sale of ivory here in the United States, removing the Amer America and the American consumer uh, from the market that's, d that's driving uh, this devastation, this epidemic of ivory trafficking. And we also challenged, successfully challenged China to do the same. And in fact, China has fulfilled their commitments and just last year began to close their infamous uh, government-sanctioned ivory markets. We, um, we worked with zoos and aquariums and many other conservation partners to improve the status of dozens and dozens of species, including sea turtles and black-footed ferret and manatee and California condor. And, um, and on California condor coming full circle, um, this past September was my first annual conference as president and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And we were able to recognize the work of six AZA accredited zoos over uh, nearly five decades of work to recover the California condor. From 22 birds in 1981, there were 22 condor left on the face of the planet. They were all captured and brought into uh, human care. We now have more than 450 California condors and more than 275 of them are flying free in the skies over the United States and Mexico, and, and we celebrated the, the great work of these zoos and aquariums in leading that effort. So now I am 
uh, chairman or, or president and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. We represent, we accredit and represent uh, 232 of the world's finest zoological institutions, places that you would recognize like the Bronx Zoo or the Central Park Zoo or San Diego Zoo, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium, Georgia Aquarium, Shedd Aquarium, and Trevor Zoo um, here uh, uh, in, nearby. Um, and, uh, and it is, um, it is a time, an important time, and an opportune time uh, to join this organization, and I'll speak to that more. But um, as, we, um, as we think about the conservation of wild nature, we are facing three great challenges, and they all center around us, people. Um, you cannot think about or conceive the conservation of wildlife in today's world without starting with the impact of people. We share the planet with 7.5 billion people today. Um, by 2050, we will be nearly 10 billion strong. So we are going to add another 2.5 billion people to the planet. Um, and bear in mind that from in the five decades from 1970 until today, we added about 4.5 billion people to the planet. And during this period of time, Many scientists believe that, um, that the total animal population of the planet has been decreased by 50 to 60 percent. So add another two and a half billion uh, to that total. We are a direct threat uh, to uh, biological diversity. Uh, reflecting that, um, this, slide, uh, this fly, slide represents something um, uh, um, the, uh, about the effect that we are having on the planet. So if you look at the total biomass, the anthropomass, many call it, the total biomass of human beings um, and the animals, that we, the, the, the mammals that we keep to eat and, and keep as pets, uh, that that anthropomass represents 90% of the total mammalian biomass on the planet. So we and cows and sheep and pigs and dogs and cats represent 90% of the total mammalian biomass on the planet. Everything else, all the elephants and lions and tigers and rats and raccoons and rhinoceros, all other mammals, terrestrial mammals on the planet represent 10% of the total biomass that remains on the planet today. And it's not just more people. It's more affluent people. Uh, the, the, the world population is growing, uh, but the world, is, world population is becoming more like us, more access to the things that create quality of life, uh, electricity, transportation, education, health care, abundant, affordable, and healthy supplies of food and water. So we are going to continue to consume as we become more in number and greater in affluence, we are going to consume more and more of the ecological uh, space on the planet. We're going, to, we're going to demand more food, more fiber, more fuel, and what that means for all the rest of what we call biological diversity, less and less and less. There will be wildlife on the planet. But unless we become much better, much stronger, much more aligned, much smarter in how we drive conservation, then the world's wildlife will be more and more constituted by things that are adept at living in the shadow of uh, human ecology. So the other threats, as we think about humans, um, are increasing urbanization. So we are increasingly, as in a time when humans need to be more engaged and more knowledgeable about conservation, we are more and more distant from it. As you can see here, the global population um, in 2020, about 55% of us uh, live in uh, or around cities. That's projected to be 64.9% by 2050. Here in the United States, 82% of us live in and around cities. 
accordingly, we are l l more disconnected from nature than we have ever been before. Um, Americans spend 93% of their time indoors. 6% of that time is in automobile. I, re I resemble that remark, right? Um, children are spending four hours a week um, outdoors. They spend more than 35 hours a week on some kind of electronic device. And these trends are not, uh, are not going down. These trends are expected to continue and worsen. So we are, we are more, we are more affluent, and we are more disconnected from nature than we have ever been before. And at this same time, our, our faith in institutions is declining. And that is across the board, the Supreme Court, the presidency, uh, the media, big business, banks, unions, public schools. Um, the public's faith in uh, great institutions is declining at a time when we need great institutions to help us find innovative solutions to these problems. And that's true of zoos and aquariums as well. Approval ratings for zoos and aquariums, although still very high, have been on a, a steady and significant decline. So these great challenges, a growing human population, uh, which is a direct threat to biological diversity, um, increasingly urbanized and nature disconnected public, and declining confidence in great institutions. But there is good reason for hope. Um, and here's, here's why. And, there's, and, and it is reflected uh, in the AZA accredited zoos and aquariums. We are a major force in driving field conservation. Our 232 accredited members in 2016 spent a collective $216 million in direct support for field conservation. So if we just maintain the status quo over the next five years, we will invest more than $1 billion um, in uh, direct support uh, for field conservation. But we're not just going to be satisfied with the status quo. Um, people are coming to us. Uh, last, uh, this year, our members will host more than 200 million visitors. So these are people that are coming to zoos and aquariums because they have an affinity for animals. So we have an opportunity to educate, to inspire them, to care about nature, and to act in the defense of wild nature. Um, and, and these are inspirational opportunities, and I see it everywhere I go within AZA's accredited members. I see it when people are feeding uh, giraffes at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo or Dallas Zoo. I see it when they're staring into jelly exhibits at Monterey Bay Aquarium or Texas State Aquarium. I see it when they're watching uh, red pandas at National Zoo or at Trevor Zoo here at Millbrook School. I see it when they're watching a tiger training exhibit at the Jacksonville Zoo or Gardens, when they're watching cheetahs run at Columbus zoo, when they're staring at an awesome whale shark at the Georgia Aquarium, when they're looking eyeball to eyeball at a baby orangutan um, at the Indianapolis Zoo. Uh, there's magic in these moments. People who are otherwise disconnected uh, from animals have an opportunity to make that direct connection uh, with an animal that they have very little or, or no opportunity to see um, in nature. And they're allowing a, a new generation of, of citizens to connect with nature in the way that is important and relevant to them, not the way that I would want them to connect with nature or you would want them to connect with nature, but the ways that are meaningful and relevant for them. And while we're connecting people to nature, um, while we are providing people with an excellent uh, um, educational and fun opportunity, we're rebuilding their faith in great institutions, uh, which is going, again, going to help us to drive solutions to these complex and difficult problems. But we can't be satisfied with the status quo. The status quo is a dangerous place. Um, and when you think about uh, the Standard & Poor 500, just over the last decade, these powerful names have disappeared from the S&P 500. Why? Because they were satisfied with their status quo and comfortable with their status quo. And many experts believe that 
50% of the companies on the Standard & Poor 500 today will not be there in 10 years. So status quo is a dangerous place that we want to avoid. We're playing a high stakes game as we think about the future of wildlife. And many people and, and organizations are betting against our collective ability to drive public opinion and shape the future of wildlife and wild nature. And I'm proud to be at the Association of Zoos and Aquariums at this point in time because I do believe we have a unique opportunity to drive conservation directly by the investment of dollars and returning uh, the revenue that is coming from visitors and returning that to the conservation of nature by inspiring people to care about nature and to act on their own individually, um, collectively, uh, to conserve wild nature. Um, and restoring faith in great public institutions. So that's, that's our mission at the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And I believe that we have an unparalleled opportunity. Yes, these are challenging times. Yes, they're great challenges. Yes, there's a lot of reason for concern about the future of wild nature, but there is reason for optimism. And one of those reasons is because we have 232 um, exceptional institutions that employ imaginative and energetic people and, and provide opportunity um, for guests to come and learn and be inspired and act on their own. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Thank you. Dan looks like Superman. And he's a little bit of a Superman. So we're going to switch presentations here. And uh, and uh, we are in agreement that we need a revolution. We need a revolution now. Um, it's shocking to me that um, with Dan, it, we met this time around. This morning, we uh, made a presentation to uh, the Millbrook School kids, and we were surprised on how much the presentations uh, were similar, and we had uh, similar views. This one is even <laughs> more um, um, in line, because we even share a graph. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this is why, uh, so I'm going to try to make the presentation complementary um, uh, to Dan, because I don't want to repeat the same thing. So um, he could not be more eloquent uh, uh, about the, the, the current situation and the, at the same time the opportunity we have to make a difference with the resources we have. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the, the different stakeholders and all the different people trying to make a difference and protect the natural world, including zoos. So it's going to be a little more ecosystemic view of, of um, the, the work and what, we need to, what I think we need to do in the future. So the human population is going up uh, dramatically, and uh, that means that... Um, the, the, there is an increased pressure on the natural systems that made our um, species successful to begin with. And um, so we have um, a, an increased uh, demand on, on, on food, water, shelter, energy, and health issues. I, I, I see those as the main umbrella it, it challenges that we need to address um, in more than thinking of um, gorillas, which I love, and elephants. So how is that we are going to have a better understanding and tackle uh, challenges? Um, this is a market in, in Chiapas, uh, in a town uh, called um, San Juan Chamula, and, and um, these are Mayan Xochitl uh, villages, and they are 100% Indigenous. They don't recognize the, the federal government 
in Mexico, and they have a very, um, every Sunday this happens, and I don't know how they're going to do to produce enough food in a simple way that, that they're doing, and that's gonna be a, a one of the challenges. And, and what we're talking about here is not new. We are not saying anything that is shattering new. Actually, in 1978, the first international conference on research in conservation biology happened at UC San Diego, and we are incredibly lucky to have here with us, um, and one of the main actors um, of that, it, it, it was the formal you know, creation of a conservation biology as a, an interdisciplinary field. And so Bruce Wilcox, Michael Soleil, Jared Diamond, um, Tom Lovejoy, all these guys were my heroes. I read books from them and I never thought I would be here today. Uh, um, so it's a, to me it's a big deal. Um, and I hope you uh, also appreciate that. So conservation biology uh, started quite a while ago and it evolved. It evolved um, rapidly as scientists understood better of what it meant in terms of all the factors and, and, and the different uh, synergies across disciplines. And, and uh, so um, we have um, an, an incredible, so I'm gonna go over a little bit of, of, of uh, each of the big categories of stakeholders. One of them um, is scientific research. And um, each of these fields can of, uh, had their own situations and evolved in, in in different ways, and uh, it has become, a, they, there is cross collaboration and it has become very clear that we have to increase that a couple of orders of magnitude um, a, to make a, a difference. So scientific research uh, shed a lot of light um, into things uh, we didn't know, and, and scientists use the scientific method very much, very much like you did, and, um, and uh, to shed light in, in these challenges. And, and uh, in, there's this tension or uh, synergy between, it's more positive synergy, between uh, basic and applied research. And not all research will lead to the conservation. This is a baby red panda. And this is research that happens at the Smithsonian where I work. And, uh, so we, we focus on applied research because w uh, our ultimate goal is to protect species and ecosystems and, and, and create a better world, a, a healthier environment for animals and people. Um, w when, when it comes to research, I don't know if we all share the urgency of, of what we need to know right now to act. So it's not only, you know, science is a powerful tool if you use it. Otherwise, you generate knowledge and it goes in a paper, it goes in a drawer, nobody reads it, big deal. What, what how are you changing anything uh, doing that? So, um, and the system rewards, you know, the, the success of scientists is measured in publications. And that is a measurement, but I would like to measure that in how you change the world. You can publish a lot of things that do nothing. So, science alone, will not be enough to protect the environment. Science is a big part and a big tool and a powerful one to protect the environment. In academia, I'm kind of mixing a little bit of a positive and negative. Academia grew in a way, uh, and, and, and again, there are a lot of um, uh, degrees now that didn't exist before. Uh, conservation biology didn't exist before. So I'm a veterinarian. That was the closest thing to being a conservationist when I grew up in Argentina. That's my accent. Um, so there are a lot of a, a really creative uh, um, professors and new degrees coming, a, a coming up. But um, I think we need to rethink how we, what we do and how uh, we do in academia and how we are training the next generation of conservationists. And um, in, we have been reassuring each other that um, that 
the revolution is needed because the environmental problems caused by uh, this dramatic increase in human population is not going to be resolved if we create slightly improved versions of ourselves. So we need to rethink the whole thing, not look back, but look forward to towards solutions. And that's a really exciting line that I, that I saw on the, on the Cary Institute um, in a cover slide. And I think that's, that's the answer, focus on solutions. So um, when you think of the way we obtain degrees in the US, you go from general to particular, you get your PhD, you know a lot about this very specific thing, then you get a job and you realize you needed to know a lot more that you never knew. And, and uh, so it, that learning in most cases is not con contextual. It happens in, in academia and you have your, your law school and th th that's a tribe and then you have your medical school, that's an, another tribe, and you have the biologists, and we have our own jokes, and, and we like to shop at REI, and all these things. <laughs> so these are, these are different tribes, and we don't really collaborate the way we should. And um, then we have NGOs, and NGOs have been doing a, an incredible job, and, and the focus of NGOs have has um, expanded and diversified greatly as we understood the complexities of conservation. And uh, this is a picture of Makushi children in northeastern Amazon. And it was a program that I run in the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, on citizen science. And, um, and uh, these kids got into birds. Um, they really love them, not because Audubon wanted, but because they wanted because the boys wanted to impress the girls with what they knew. <laughs> Those boys are now um, a, a business owners. They are the best, among the best a, a bird guides in the country. They can assure you you're gonna see harpy eagle and, and cock of the rock and these animals that, that it's, it's incredible. And, and, and what it took was not one NGO from the US sharing the wealth of knowledge. What it took was the adaptability of a bunch of middle level or low level people who went there and found ourselves teaching how to write resumes, how to interview for a job, um, how to be on time, and uh, how to organize a program, how to report, how to fix a motorcycle. I have no idea, I learned with them, so they are are as much uh, uh, of my teachers as my uh, formal education teachers. Um, government agencies have played an incredible role, and, and uh, this is the black-footed ferret, and it's another uh, uh, image, you know, a species that we chose to, to feature. And uh, uh, this species was rediscovered, was considered extinct. It was found by a farm dog. Um, the farmer took the animal the dead animal from the mouth of the dog to a taxi taxidermist. The taxidermist said, this is weird. Let's go to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And the Fish and Wildlife Service says, this, this is like finding a dinosaur, right? So how, what do we do? What do we do? And that's an, a, a, an incredible example on science being one part of it. And the Smithsonian, as the Smithsonian, we have the science to a, a reproduce these animals. And there were only 18 left in the entire world, and there is something called inbreeding. You don't want only seven or eight of them were uh, in, in, you know, in eligible for reproduction. And, uh, and our scientists created a special software to match them to um, maximize um, a genetic diversity. What happens if they don't like each other? The computer says, these two should go together, and they go, ah, oh, no way. <laughs> And then uh, somebody has to come up with artificial insemination on black-footed ferrets. Who knows about that? No one. <laughs> so the, we are seeing three things here that is a pattern, and I'm going to go over those three things uh, at the end. Um, so in government agencies, we have, <laughs> you're going to like this, we have career 
people and we have a, a political appointees and sometimes they don't see eye to eye. We have an enormous amount of bureaucracy. We have changing, um, changing administrations that may throw a wrench or a toolbox. Um, <laughs> in, and, uh, but also they have incredible power of using science to pass in, in regulations and legislation to make a great impact that nobody else can do. So as, as you start seeing this map, um, that was something that um, um, we all, in all these places, share something in common. We love animals, we wanted to make our lives matter, and we wanted to, um, we wanted this world to be better because we were here. So I'm going to share a little bit of my, of my personal story. I don't want you guys, you heard that this morning, so I'm going to be brief. Um, I was born in Argentina. I grew up in, in, in a farm town, exposed to nature very early, and um, I found out that I loved animals. Nobody taught me to lo love animals. I developed that love. You cannot teach anybody to love anything. You can create the conditions, though. If not, we have Smithsonian <laughs> scientists who can make a wonderful thing. So anyway, um, so my, my two heroes were uh, my science teacher. She took me seriously, and I will never forget that, how that felt. It felt incredible. And then my next-door neighbor was a vet, and that was the closest thing to being a conservationist. And uh, he took me under his wing, and I, I was super lucky. Uh, that was incredible. And I wanted to be a vet because there was no conservationist around at, at that time. Um, so I went to vet school and I was doing embryo transfer on Holsteins and, and dairy cows. So I wanted to do more. I wanted to make a difference. So I wanted to work in conservation. There was nothing in Argentina. I came to the States because in all the movies, they were like the US guys saving the world. So I wanted to be I wanted to be, although everybody said, That's hap that happens in the movies. Well, I wanted to be in that movie. R what is funny is that the movie ended up being way better than I thought it would be. Uh, my, my, uh, my first job was at the Miami Zoo as an educator, which was wonderful because I got paid for talking about animals. It was like, how can you get paid, <laughs> right? For doing, like eating chocolate, right? You get paid for that. <laughs> um, so I learned it. I, I, I thought, well, I'm going to get my foot in the door and I'm going to reveal this great idea of applying, doing artificial insemination and embryo transfer on endangered species. So when I broke the news, I got like, oh, yeah, the Smithsonian is doing that. Like, what's the Smithsonian? I want to go there. Funny story. Um, so at the Miami Zoo, I learned the, the, my, my, my frame of reference for zoos was not very good. Uh, it was like a very sad a place where the animals were in horrible conditions, so I didn't, like, I didn't have a very positive view of zoos. But then I got to, to know what American zoos, AZA zoos, were doing for conservation, and that blew my mind. I thought, well, I, I want to be part of this. So I started learning about learning. I started learning about people. Funny thing, because I went to vet school because I liked animals better than people. I'm not the only one. I'm the only one who, you know, who says that on a microphone. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I changed my views. I like people now. Um, so then after that, I wanted, to, I wanted to get in the trenches of conservation. And there was this new program uh, at uh, the Audubon Society. It was a Latin America program created by um, a, a common friends uh, who came from WCS. And so I got, uh, I was single, so I got, uh, my boss was married with kids, so I got the traveling part of it. It was phenomenal. I went um, and met people that, that I learned a lot from them, and it was worth even more than any PhD or, or a veterinary degree I could have earned. Then I put all of that together, and I went to the Brookfield Zoo. This is a big zoo, and, uh, and I learned about conservation psychology. And that blew my mind again, like I had any mind left from so much blowing. <laughs> so that, that helped me understand people. That all the things that, that I was doing intuitively, there was research behind it. It was new, relatively new research. So 
it was great because I could put all these things together and look at the holistic pathway that a kid may take, like you. <laughs> You're on the, first, on the first row, so I'm going to pick on you. Um, but, you know, what, what is the pathway? What are the opportunities they are looking for? What are the opportunities they get? And, and, and how can we make a difference by design? Not by uh, feeling, no, no, by design, uh, intentionally. So after that, um, funny story, there was this opening at, uh, this, at the Smithsonian with the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation. And I could see so many professional conservationists fail. Failure is part of, 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 of life, but like totally unprepared, like I was. And I thought, this is a chance to do things differently. How is that we can train the next generation, not the way we were trained, but facing the future? How is that we can invest in these young people to, to make a difference, to make a quantum leap? And the answer to that is, um, um, I jumped ahead. <laughs> Um, is innovation. How do we go from a person who is very well versed in the scientific method to, this is my friend Kate Evans, she's a, a, a phenomenal elephant researcher in, 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 in Botswana. I arrived in Botswana, Kate was not at the airport, somebody else with my sign like, oh, what, what happened to Kate? Well, she's solving a problem. Okay, so I'm driven to this a car shop and she was trying to get something from, like nobody taught her to do that. She had to do that and a thousand other things that nobody taught her to do. But also nobody taught her she could not do that because she was a girl. And that was amazing. So I'm thinking employers want employees who can hit the ground running and can think outside the box. Are we doing that in academia? You want to take a guess? The answer is no. So how do we go from uh, training the three things I promised you? There's the technical training. You have to know your math. You have to know your scientific method. You have to know your Krebs cycle, all those wonderful things. Um, but also, you have to know how to fail. Nobody teaches you how to fail in, in academia. You just fail and you have to suck it up. And what do you do after you fail? That's the most important thing, because you are going to fail. What do you do after? And the third thing is that I feel it, it, that this, the, the education system crushes your imagination and your creativity. And uh, so the ability to come up with something new is very rare. And uh, so now I have the chance, and I want to take this as an example of, OK, how do, I, how do we look at ourselves the hard way, and what do we do to go to the next level, to conservation 2.0? I'm not in a classroom with 150 students learning about something that I just have to memorize. I'm out here actually talking to people that have gone out there, have done this science. You're immersed, you're surrounded by passionate people, and you're surrounded by people that actually know what they're doing. And that makes, that makes a huge difference compared to a traditional classroom. This is a great opportunity for anyone who's interested in wildlife, nature, um, endangered species to come out here and just get this immersive, hands-on experience. Knowing that I'm not alone, you know, a lot of science and a lot of learning we do in the classrooms just makes you feel sterile, but I don't get that out here. I feel like I'm part of a community. I feel like the people that are out here care about me. This is like a dream come true. I get to go out and look for birds and look for bugs and hike through the woods, and, and that's our classroom. So that's what we can do for the future. We can leverage a global network of practitioners. The, com the combined network of the Smithsonian Institution, George Mason University, and our friends 
is phenomenal. In each of these sites, there's a learning classroom and a learning lab. And in each of these people, there's a mentor. And, and we want to leverage that. It's a very unique access we have to, to this um, wealth of, of, of mentoring opportunities. So we want to focus on not on the problem. We want to focus on the solution. How do we train these kids to come up with innovative solutions? Not to go over recipes of how things should be solved and then when they don't work, they don't know what to do. We want to promote innovation, collaboration, actual collaboration, not collaboration between a geneticist and a reproductive physiologist, but a collaboration between a conservationist and an engineer, or a psychologist, or an economist. Um, we want to embrace technology, not be technophobes, but use technology as a tool to solve problems. And we want to focus on entrepreneurship. That is super important. What opportunities are there that um, we are overlooking? And it's important because if we, have to, if we want to save animals, we have to work with humans. We have to know humans, understand humans, if we want to make a difference for, for animals. So we do need, need a revolution. Um, and we are ready for that revolution. I think, I feel we are, we are ready. That revolution has to start now uh, with us, with the things we can control. It's very easy to feel discouraged with the things we cannot control. But there are a lot of things we can control. And in that revolution, we can imagine all together, AZA, George Mason University, the Cary Institute, the Millbrook School, the Smithsonian. How can we make a better future for animals and people. And we can. And, and I would invite you and challenge you to do something amazing starting now. Thank you. So you've just heard uh, two really special presentations about the role that zoos can play uh, in, the, in the time of great conservation challenge. Uh, and I don't know whether, Dan, you would like to make a remark in response to what Ricardo has said. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to have uh, mic microphones around for Anybody who wants to ask a question uh, or ask a comment? I just say it's great being the warm-up band for Ricardo Stanos. <laughs> uh, that, uh, second, second time today. It works out pretty well. <laughs> it so, was my mistake to say, you go first. I like it that way. <laughs> because you had all the slides I wanted to show. So <laughs> it, it's great to know. And, and something I forgot to mention, I'm forever grateful to the, to the zoo industry and the Miami Zoo for giving me the chance to uh, make that difference, to, to be an actor in that movie I wanted to be in. Thank you. So in the second row. Hi, my name is Lynn Rogoff and I also teach interdisciplinary uh, media combined with endangered animal subjects. And uh, my question to you is, E.L. Wilson has come up with this goal of sharing half the planet with the animals. And I wondered if you thought this was an achievable goal and whether you think it's a goal that the planet is willing to contemplate. I see you're looking at me, so both. Of you. both. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go first. All right. <laughs> so I can be the warm-up band. <laughs> so um, 
I'm going to give you my personal uh, opinion. E.O. Wilson is one of my heroes, uh, it, you know, it, and it's it, the, the, the books he wrote are, have been um, very formative to me and, and very inspiring. I don't think that's uh, something I want to do uh, because that means uh, you have 50% uh, of the planet that is for animals. What happens to the other 50%? How are you, I mean, it, I think we need to think of a way of overlapping, of having a working landscapes and seascapes, for instance, better than having these isolated parts. And um, of course, I'm not going to contradict one of my heroes, but um, if I had to put my money on it, I would put it on uh, innovation, in using the knowledge of zoos in managing species so they don't go extinct. Um, um, because I think having this uh, world apart from nature can um, help spiral down our disconnection with nature. With all due respect to you, Wilson. So Dan? So I, I think it was um, the composer Leonard Bernstein who said that um, in order to achieve something great, um, you need uh, an ambitious goal and not enough time to achieve it. Um, and, and so I think what E.O. Wilson has done is challenge us to think about an ambitious goal that we don't have enough time to achieve. And so I think I'm you know, looking at young people in the audience, and we were meeting with young people today um, at Millbrook School, and, and I think we need um, as, you know, difficult aspirational goals. And what that, that goal that is reflected uh, by E.O. Wilson is the goal that we have to protect big spaces on the planet. We have to leave room um, for wild nature. And, and whether it's 50% or 40% or 60%, um, we have to make big spaces like the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. We have to protect them. Um, and we have to think bigger than we've ever thought before. So I like the ambitious goal. Whether it's achievable or not, I like the, I like the aspiration that's reflected in that. So I'll, I'll chip in on that. So I work with. Uh, half Earth, uh, but I work with anybody who's got ambitious goals. Uh, and one thing I can tell you is Ed's vision of Half Earth is not half the planet with no people on it, right? And all's crowded on the other half. Uh, so it's it's much more more com complicated than that. Uh, and the way I like to phrase it is that we should embed human aspiration in nature and stop thinking of it as something separate from ourselves. So there's somebody with a microphone. Great. Hi, I was wondering if, um, given that the, the population of the Earth is increasing dramatically, but more and more people are living to, in cities, I was wondering if there was any study being done about um, people leaving the land and freeing up land for animals. Would there anybody study that, whether there's any potential in that, uh, and sort of combined with that more concentrated um, agricultural development, so you, perhaps you can use less land? That's a question for Laura. <laughs> the, um, uh, yes, there, there are people that are looking at that, and that's the silver lining in that cloud, that people are moving to cities, and so we have opportunity to make human life more efficient, because cities are more efficient places um, to live. <clears throat> so I think if there, again, if there, there, there is hope and there's reason for optimism that we can build the cities of the future, which are much more efficient, um, uh, effective places for humans to leave, leaving more land um, free for nature. And, and using intensive agriculture um, is also a way to kind of reduce our collective ecological footprint. So, so um, technology at, at once is a threat, but it's also a big part of the solution. And I think we have to think innovatively about how we'll be living in the future and how we'll be living with nature and particularly the kind of interface between, between humans and nature. So if you look at Latin America, you can see uh, a place where that shift happened a lot earlier than some of the places being talked about at the moment. Uh, and it really did take a lot of pressure off 
of wild nature. Uh, but that's not the only pressure that gets put on wild nature. So part of the issue is, uh, can you feed that number of people without destroying another square inch of nature? And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, it requires a much more orderly uh, sort of approach to development. Uh, but we waste a lot of food in the world. 30 to 40% of all food is wasted. That could be drastically reduced. Uh, there are places where productivity could be uh, greatly improved without uh, having problems of nitrogen pollution and the rest. <coughs> uh, and our doctors are telling us, you know, to change our diets anyway uh, and eat more fish and chicken and less of other things which put a lot of pressure on the planet. So these things are possible. It's just how do you get that kind of order uh, put in the uh, development trajectory? Would you identify yourself, please? Sure. Uh I'm Erwin Sperber. I'm a sociologist at uh, SUNY New Paltz. Uh, my question has to do with the uh, uh, underlying issue that I take uh, both of you uh, are concerned with uh, about the dramatic uh, increase in population and uh, the role of so many of the popular environmental NGOs that carefully dance around the subject because perhaps they somehow don't want to antagonize their donor base, but uh, wh what do you think it would take to promote a national and even international uh, m movement that would uh, 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 support uh, a, a, mu a much more proactive view of uh, contraception and including uh, abortion or the right to abortion? Since I hopefully don't have to worry about Senate confirmation again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, th I think we need to build awareness uh, so that people understand that you can't simply add two and a half billion more people to the planet and, and more affluent people. Um, and people um, globally are being lifted out of poverty. Um, uh, that's, that's a good thing if you're a human being. Like the, glo the global middle class is rising and people are being lifted from poverty. In 1980, nine, more than 90% of Chi the Chinese people lived on less than a dollar and 90 cents a day. Um, that number is 3% today. Um, so, um, so, but we're building a consuming class um, of human beings, more like us, and they deserve to be more like us. But. Um, but what, what we have to do is build awareness. And, and I think people will make good choices. Um, so I'm not, I don't think that we can tell people, and, and certainly the policies of China, you know, to kind of uh, reduce the numbers of children that people um, could have were, were a disaster for, um, for China. And so I don't think we can tell people what to do, but I think we can build a global awareness that we have to live differently with the planet. Um, we have to live more sustainably. Um, we have to think about the consequences of our actions for wild nature and the, and the animals that are in, in our care. And so I think that's w uh, the role that a, that a great organization like the Cary Institute can play to help us build that global awareness. But it has to involve the notion of limitation, that we as humans need to limit and, and control our behavior and understand the consequence of our behavior. So I totally support that, and for the record, uh, <laughs> I've been a trustee of Population Action International. I'm now an honorary trustee. Uh, there are also really important ways to advance what you're talking about uh, by improving the state of women around the world, mm -hmm. uh, education of girls in places where a lot of that hasn't happened in the past makes a huge difference in the end in population. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for just two more questions and there are two people with the mic, one over there and one over there. And I'm sorry, because you can throw it all my way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, just make, is this on? Oh, cool. Um, hi, my name's Megan Lung. I'm an environmental analyst with the New York State DEC um, Hudson River Estuary Program. 
and my natal zoo is the Detroit Zoo, so I was really excited watching your slides. I was waiting for one, one of our pictures to show up there. Um, but in my personal life and in my professional life, um, I'm a person of color, and in looking at the room and looking at my field and looking at um, some of the video that was shown, I didn't see a lot of people who looked like me doing that kind of study. Um, you mentioned it in your presentation how many tons of ivory were crushed, and that's wonderful. <coughs> but I think of the people in how the continent of Africa has been ravaged by imperialism and what those people look like who maybe have to resort to poaching. So my question for both of you is, in order to start a revolution, how do we bring along people who have been left behind or who are most likely to be victimized by us wanting to kind of pull the ladder up behind us with um, resource expansion and spread of technology and electricity? I love that question, and I'm gonna tell you a little story. W uh, one of my first jobs at the Miami Zoo was to translate a fish and wildlife program um, a, a into Spanish. And that program is called Suitcase for Survival. And at that time, I used uh, a, a typewriter because I didn't have a computer. I had never worked with a computer. So, and it had, uh, it wasn't a PowerPoint, it was a slide show. And I had the carousel and I'm looking at the slides and all the good guys were white males with khaki uniforms, like looking like Marines. And all the mean guys were indigenous looking people. And I was furious because I'm white, my skin is white, but, but I'm brown, right? So, I, I, I'm, so in, in order to, um, for the revolution to work, we need everyone. And, and we need uh, everyone's talents and minds and hearts. And we need to understand the lives of those other than us. That's why I, um, I might have mentioned in this presentation, I, I say this a lot, but uh, in order to save uh, um, elephants, um, not only you need uh, elephant scientists, you need people scientists, people who understand why these things happen. It's not that people are mean and they do this for fun and they kill an elephant and go, ha, ha, ha. Well, no, that's not the way it works. Um, a, a little related to the previous question, nobody likes to be told what to do, especially when there's a context of imperialism and Eurocentrism. Um, so um, it, I think it's our collective um, we're aware of the whiteness of conservation, and, uh, and I think that it's everyone's priority to change that. Now, what are we doing about that? In my context at the school, that's what I can control, right? Uh, we have an incredible diversity in our student body when you look at the, at the skin color, but they are all middle class that happen to be of different ethnic backgrounds. So we need to look at the entire thing. How, who is, what are those bright minds uh, that have a different context that can greatly contribute to this um, solution? So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but okay. Well, it's an incredibly important point. Uh, and there's also another lens on it, which is uh, environmental justice. Uh, and how mm. poor communities tend to be treated uh, as l less of a priority by environmental agencies or conservation or whatever it may be. Uh, what we're actually talking about here with the biodiversity crisis and all the things that are driving it is actually the greatest environmental justice issue mm. of all time. It's the world we're going to leave to the next generations. Uh, and we need everybody helping with that. Yeah, I would, I, I would just say thank you for asking the question. And it, be, it is an important question that we make conservation relevant to, uh, to the changing face of America and, and to the world. And so, uh, again, as I think about zoos and aquariums, the promise that we have in zoos and aquariums are places like Detroit Zoo. If you go to Detroit Zoo, it looks like Detroit. If you go to the Los Angeles Zoo, it looks like the Los Angeles. The signs are bilingual. Um, and so 
Uh, it's not that way everywhere, um, but we're working to make it more that way so that we're engaging more of a diversity in America into the, uh, and in the world in the way um, in the, into the things that we need to do. I would say um, Africa ivory is, is the essence of imperialism, mm -hmm. that it's not the Africans who are being enriched by the poaching of ivory. It's the traffickers who are being enriched and they're stealing the heritage of, um, of Africans um, by doing that. And so um, the, in, in order to help um, Africa help itself, and, and, the, and Africa is helping itself in, in the uh, uh, epidemic of trafficking and very courageous actions by leaders in Botswana um, and Namibia um, and other places in Africa. But, uh, but it, 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 to me, it's the, it's the very essence of imperialism. Okay, I, I have uh, a comment and then a question. My comment, I, and both of you appear to be optimists, and I am a, sort of an optimistic pessimist. <laughs> I, it's my belief that, that there will be some kind of plague, that's the depressing side, uh, that will control or suppress the increase in the population. Um, and there's no, no, no way of knowing it, but um, you know, with the way germs and microbes are growing, mm -hmm. there's just no way of knowing, but that's my supposition. Um, the question is, what do you think of the possibility of the current administration removing the protection from the Hawaiian archipelago and then replacing it when it's gone? <laughs> um, I think the, I think the probability of the president changing the um, Papahano Makukea Marine Monument designation is next to zero. Um, I, I really, it, the Hawaiian people support it, um, and and the American people largely support it. And I, I'll, although that has been mentioned, I, I I can't imagine them doing that because there's no reason to do it. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> You're cute. <laughs> I, see, I am optimistic. <laughs> um, uh, but no, I, and I, I really do believe that it, it, that it will be protected. I'm, 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 l I'm less a concerned about that monument than other monuments um, uh, in the terrestrial context. But I, again, I, I do think that, that we have to be optimistic. And I, I do think there is room to be optimistic, although we have to be sobered by the challenges that we're facing. We have to be aware of the, of the immensity of those challenges. But, but, I, but I do think, and it was reflected in the young people that we met at Millbrook School over the last couple of days. I mean, you can't speak with those young people and see their talent and energy and dedication and, and not be inspired by that and hopeful uh, because of it. Last question, short, quick. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Michelle Finley, and um, <clears throat> I'm here with my son, who's a budding conservationist. And I just want to tell you, truth be told, the reason why we came here tonight was because we have been ardent um, people that would never go to a zoo or an aquarium. And I know this is a simplistic question and basic, but that's really what brought us here. Um, and I, I see that my mind has been changed that there is great work to be done, and part of it is connecting people, not so much that boycott zoos and aquariums, but that just don't even know about mm -hmm. conservation and ecology. But there's so much in the news and so much that you see about how animals that we love are treated. And so is there some type of like designation or some type of certification? How, like, because you don't know, and so often it's heartbreaking when you do go to a zoo or an aquarium. Yeah, there, so um, there is something called a, a, a bad zoo um, and aquarium. And so, um, and across the world, there are, there are many hundreds of them. Um, and here in the United States, the things that you know, we might call a roadside zoo or an exhibit or a traveling circus and things like that, with it, they just can't take adequate care of animals. But I would say, look for the AZA accreditation. AZA is recognized worldwide as the gold standard in the zoological community. In order to be accredited, you have to be accredited, re accredited and then re-accredited every five years. 
Um, you, we look at their uh, care of animals, their veterinary staff, their, uh, their uh, vi visitation, their guest service programs. They have to be involved in conservation. They have to be a purposeful organization. Um, they have to be doing research on animals. Um, and so, and we look at their finance um, and their governance to make sure um, that they're secure so that what we're seeing today is gonna be maintained um, into the future. So I would say look for, uh, it, it's, it's to my self-interest to tell you this, of course, um, but I would say look for the AZA accreditation and you can, go, you can go to our website, you can see the accredited zoos and aquariums near you or where you're, where you're going to visit, but they are, um, they are purposeful conservation organizations and when you go there, you can be assured that the animals are receiving, the, they're the best cared for animals on the planet. Um, but there are things called you know, bad zoos and aquariums and we need, to work to, uh, we need to work to push them out of the business and we need to lift up uh, the, the organizations that are at the margins of performance. I'm gonna add a, a little a note from my personal experience having a really bad a, a frame of reference for zoos. Um, if, if you have the chance to meet uh, the people working at zoos and you can ask them if they um, cherish uh, the notion of a, a captive animal. Nobody likes that, nobody wants that. Uh, and, uh, but there is a reality and, and we have to make the best out of that reality. And you will be shocked by the amount of commitment, professionalism, training, and um, I, what I see is that um, if you really love something, like my, I really loved animals, so I became a professional animal lover. It's really easy to be an amateur animal lover and to be on the, on the side of things and throw rocks from, you know, like and criticize. Give me a solution. It's easy to criticize. So the, 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 especially like each generation I see coming through the ranks in zoos, they're more and more committed, and that's why we are seeing incredible, like, it, like in the past we used to focus on the animals from afar, and now there are zoos that, like the Trevor Zoo, working with endangered species from in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And it might not be giraffes that bring people, but those are, are, are very equally important species that they can make a difference. And these people are incredibly dedicated, and they spend a lot of uh, uh, time and money in training and to me, they are some of, some of my heroes. If right. I could just quickly, um, the, the Trevor Zoo here is a great example. It's, it's one of our smallest members, um, but they're, they're working on the conservation of, of species locally, like the wood turtle and the bog turtle. So they are working every day to help those species. That you can see the red wolf um, at Trevor Zoo. If it weren't for, for zoos, there would be nothing called a red wolf. There were only seven red wolves left in the world um, about uh, 30 years ago. And if it weren't for the, their capacity to, to breed them in captivity and keep them healthy, both physically and genetically and socially, uh, we wouldn't have wild wolves, wild red wolves in the, in the eastern North Carolina and the opportunity to put them other places. So, so thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you all. Uh, it's been a great program.